Dear Kay, do you remember the way Gregory used to laugh when he thought he was alone? Like something funny was happening, but only he could see it. Good luck, Kay. Love, Sam. A poem for Gus, who always said the wedding was a bad idea. Our father never hit us kids, at least not very hard, before the day my brother said with teenage disregard that he'd be dead before he'd see a wedding in our yard. My father made him come, of course, but Gus stood far apart, just flew his kite and bottled up the storm inside his heart. talk him out of it, but though he'd never met her. We don't need a stepmom, were the words that I now pronounce you husband and wife. Make him cry. When the 
time for photos came, Dad ordered him to come, come here. here. But Gus declined, and as a sign held up his middle finger. The wind picked up, and panicked geese appeared and quickly went. But all the humans did that day was go inside the tent. came down in buckets then, but no one seemed afraid that nature might destroy the tent or dad would keep in it. The thunder sounded much too close and full of angry power, but all my father said to this was, Make the music louder. I wish that I could truly say I thought about you on that day. Out there on the beach alone, just you, the wind, the sea, and foam. But I didn't, until we found you. She never talked about him, but mom told me once if I was a boy, they were going to name me Gus. How I Want to Remember My Brother, by Sam Finch. The thing I remember is that when he made up his mind, that was it. My brother said he'd die before he ate another mushroom, and he did. At Barbara's funeral, we swore he'd never be afraid again, and he wasn't. I think Calvin always wanted to fly. Stop! Calvin! Get up, Daddy! Coming! But that day, he finally made up his mind to do it. I told him going around was impossible. Maybe if I hadn't said that, Maybe if the wind hadn't picked up. Then maybe he'd still be here. But I doubt. I think he'd already made up his mind. That's what I want to remember about my brother. Calvin's story felt strangely familiar. When I was younger, I remember trying to do the exact same thing. Milton Finch in The Magic Paintbrush.
seconds four when Milton disappeared. Goodbye, everyone. I can't believe I've been down here for 30 years. On that first day, after the shaking started, I didn't think I'd survive a week. Even a monster on the other side of the door starts to feel normal, almost friendly. And then one day, everything just stopped. Whatever that thing was, it was gone. Maybe it got tired of waiting. Or maybe I just got tired of being afraid. It's been a week now, the longest in 30 years. I'm done waiting. I have to leave. Well, I still can. I know it's out there somewhere. Whatever killed Barbara. Molly and Calvin. Maybe this is all a mistake. But I need to stop living the same day, even if it kills me. Whatever's out there, I want you to know I'm ready for it. I'm going to appreciate all of it, especially the food. I don't mind if I only have a year left, or a month, or a single week. I'd be happy with one new day. I can already imagine the sun on my face. Walter died when I was six. I can't believe my mom never told me he was down here. For 500 years, the Finches have been famous throughout Norway for their fortune and misfortune. Odin Finch buries the latest victims of the family curse, his wife Ingeborg and their newborn son, Johan. On January 7th, 1937, he set sail with his family and his house, hoping to leave the curse behind. But 40-foot waves off the coast of Washington send the house and Odin to the bottom of the sea. Odin's daughter Edie, with husband Sven and baby Molly, step ashore on their new home, Orcas Island. Odin Finch is the first to be buried in the new family cemetery. His daughter Edie is already dreaming of a new Finch house.
Whatever's wrong with this family, it goes back a long ways. December 13th, 1947. Dear Diary, I'll be gone soon, but I wanted to tell somebody about what's gonna happen. It started when Mom sent me to bed without dinner. I woke up and I was starving, so I looked around for something to eat. The gerbil food was dry, but I didn't mind it. My Halloween candy was all gone. Mom, can I come out now? Sweetheart, it's late. Go to sleep. I thought about eating Christopher, but I held back. I kept eating and eating. I ate a lot of things that night. Then I heard chirping outside my window. It was a barn swallow going back to her nest. I reached out for her. And suddenly, I was a cat. I tried to be quiet, but the bird was really scared. Mom and Dad didn't even look at me. I jumped and I almost got her. I could tell she was getting really tired. Now I was up in the big tree. I promised Dad I wouldn't climb it anymore. I gobbled her up. And suddenly, I was an owl. First, all I heard was the wind. Then I heard little teeth nibbling in the grass. choking, but I couldn't stop eating. And suddenly, I was a shark. I rolled off a cliff and into the ocean. Now, I was hungry and everywhere. I wanted fat, juicy seeds. I tore 
her off her flipper, and it tasted really good. Everything had changed. Now I was a monster and I smelled people everywhere. I was big, but I moved real quietly. Yes, ah! oh, I wanted to stop, but also I didn't. Closer and closer. All my stomach started growling. And suddenly, I was me again. I held my breath for a long time, but I couldn't hear anything. I think it's waiting for me to fall asleep. But it's not going to wait much longer. It needs to be, and we both know I will be delicious. I'm not sure if I believed all of that. But I'm sure Edie would have. Of all the stories people wrote about Barbara's death, I'm surprised Edie saved this one. Oh, Jack here with another ghastly tale inspired by America's most unfortunate family. I'm calling it the surprise ending of Barbara Finch. As a child star, Barbara was famous for her scream. Now at 16, she was all washed up. A has-been. But in a lucky break, she'd been asked to perform her signature scream at a local convention for monster movie fans. It was just the boost her career needed. Unfortunately, her scream hadn't aged well. 
Mm, getting better. I think you just need the right motivation. Her biggest fan and current boyfriend, Rick, was about to demonstrate when... Now that was a great scream. It was Barbara's father, Sven. He'd slipped into a table saw and had to be rushed to the emergency room. So Barbara got stuck babysitting her youngest brother, Walter. Her convention comeback was canceled. Okay, I'm hearing frustration, but I'm not hearing terror. What if I tried... A gang of hoodlums and Halloween masks have been terrorizing Orca's Island tonight. Police are urging residents to... That came from the basement. You're right. Also, I loved your delivery on that. Why is your basement door locked? Because my dad likes making puzzles in secret passages. There's a key hidden in the music box. The secret is to keep winding and winding until finally the key pops out. Thanks, babe. I'll be back in a sec. 20 minutes later, Rick hadn't returned. So Barbara went to look for him, right on cue. She reached for the music box. And as she wound the key, she listened for Rick, but the house was silent.
is coming from inside the house. what kind of monsters they were, and she realized what was about to happen. She was going to be famous. And with her final breath, Barbara Finch gave the performance of her life. I wasn't there myself, but I hear Barbara was magnificent. Poor girl. She had a taste for stardom. But unfortunately, so did her fans. Of course, the police blamed it all on poor Rick, who disappeared the same night. And little Walter? Hiding under his bed the whole time. He took it all pretty hard. But that's another story. As for Barbara, tucked inside the music box is all they ever found of her. Her ear. Now that's what I call a real eerie tale. <laughs> Edie told me all Barbara wanted was to be remembered, as absurd as that comic was. Maybe what Edie saw was a happy ending. Dawn, I promise, you'll never forget this weekend. Yes, sir. These memories are gonna last a lifetime. Mm hmm Am I gonna have to shoot anything? It's a hunting trip, Dawn. Shooting is strongly encouraged. Perfect. It's gonna rain the whole weekend, isn't it? Never forget this weekend, Dad. That's the spirit. Okay, got it. I'm gonna take some pictures, okay? Just be careful. A camera's older than you are. Aw. You're right, Dad. It's starting to clear up. It's still freezing, though. Definitely should not have drunk all that coffee. Hmm. Hold still while I take a picture of you. I definitely won't be moving. Are you done yet? Does it sound like I'm done? Nothing quite like being outside. Hey! <laughs> That's a keeper. Oop. A little more gas in the tank, I guess. I'm just saying, I'm not always going to be here, Don. You'll need to remember this stuff if you want to survive. I'll be fine, Dad. You know who else thought he was going to be fine? Some guy who died. Don, I'm being serious. I know, Dad. You're always serious. Doesn't being out here make you want to chill out? Well, to tell you the truth, I haven't been out here in 20 years. Don, don't you think you could find something more interesting to photograph? Last time I was with my brother Calvin. Man, that was a great trip. Your grandpa's fan taught us how to fish. How to build a fire. Dad. Good eyes, Don. Before you take the shot, let me get a picture of you. Turn off your
your imagination. Focus on your target. Let me get behind you. Do I have to do this? Don, you don't have to do anything. But if you want to survive, you'll need to be strong. Yourself squared up, elbows down. Great shot, Don. <laughs> I'm proud of you, Don. Always remember that, okay? <laughs> Dad, it's twitching. I think That's it's totally still... normal, Don. Just focus on the camera. Try not to think about. Dad. Oh! Of all these stories, that's the one I wish most that my mom had told me. Dear Mrs. Finch, as Lewis's psychiatrist, I can understand your desire for an explanation. As I see it, the trouble began in January, shortly after we convinced your son to seek treatment for substance abuse. Newly sober, I believe Lewis first noticed the monotony of his daily life. He kept working at the cannery, but he withdrew part of himself. In our sessions, I saw the same behavior. His mind began to wander. I asked him to describe it. He said he started small, imagining a labyrinth. He'd feel his way about. Then something moved, bats and toads. And things that have not names. He knew it was all in his head. And he took it very seriously. I had hoped he'd find himself. But he found something more. I worried about him then, daydreaming at the cannery. I spoke with his boss, but he said Lewis had become a model employee, methodical, tireless, focused, like a whole new Lewis. So I let him go on. I even encouraged him. It seemed very promising at first. He told me he'd made a new friend. On the edge of a city he named Lewis Topia. He built the city up slowly, brick by brick. Then he made musicians. And songs for them to play. He talked about starting a band. And he was always humming something. Every day his imagination grew stronger. He no longer spoke at the cannery.
that his chopping was as reliable as ever. Then one day it struck him that all the cheering crowds, even the stones under his feet, were all in his imagination. So he could do whatever he wished. He held an election for mayor. And he won. They begged him to stay, but his mind was already wandering. It became a game for him. He'd conquer a city, then immediately push on. New Louisville. St. Louis. He started drifting away from our reality. Minneapolis, until one day he forgot to go home from the cannery. Even as his mother pleaded with him, part of Lewis kept sailing on. In Lewisburg, he heard rumors of a beautiful prince. The prince was on his own quest for radiant rainbows. He followed the sound of his silver harp. His chase led him to a golden palace east of the sun and west of the moon. Even then, his logic remained sound. He knew the world was all in his imagination. But he was so proud of having created it. In his own eyes, he'd become something greater than a king. For someone who'd never known success in the real world, I think it was overwhelming. And then it struck him that the real Lewis was not the one chopping salmon, but the one climbing the steps of a golden palace. My imagination is as real as my body, he told me. It was hard to argue with him. He began to forget the world we know. I think it pained him to remember Lewis, the cannery worker. He began to despise the man with a royal contempt. I still thought I could save him. 
even after he said he was being crowned king over all the lands of wonder. The palace would be packed with his companions. Calico had insisted on inviting him. Mrs. Finch, your son was a kind man who will be missed by all of us who knew him. My brother was really cool. I wish you could have met him. day, Edie just watched us pack and didn't say a word. Until supper, when she raised her glass and said, To our final night together, and all our final nights apart. Grandma, you know what I said about alcohol. Some of your medications are very Edith, specific- I left a present for you in the hallway. Why don't you go open it? The grown-ups have to argue now. I'm sorry, you're right. We're all leaving tomorrow. Let's just enjoy our last... I'm not leaving. Edith, you're excused. The power had been shut off that morning, but Edie always had plenty of candles. When my mom sailed the library, I don't think she knew about the other entrance. Or that Edie had a key to it. That thing you're afraid of isn't going to end when you leave the house. Edith has a right to know these stories. My children are dead because of your stories. I think it's best if Edith and I leave tonight. We'll have the nursing home send a van for you in the morning, okay? Dear Edith, there's so many stories I wish I could tell you, but there's only time for one. This is about what happened on the night you were born. That night, the tide went way, way out. It was the first and last time I ever saw the old house aground. There'd been an earthquake out in the middle of the ocean. They called it the lowest tide in a thousand years. God, it smelled awful. You know, I've seen that house every day of my life. I never thought I'd go back to it. When the fog rolled in, I lost my way. I got 
turned around. I started seeing things. Things I'd forgotten had ever existed. But when I saw them, they felt like old friends. That night, a lot of things came back to me. Or maybe I came back to them. Things I can't explain, but that I need you to try and... Edith, what are you doing in here? It's mine. Edith! Mom, you're gonna rip it! Let go! I kicked and screamed, but... Mom dragged me to the car. I never saw Great Grandma Edie again. The next morning, the van came to pick her up, but she was already gone. After that, we moved around a lot. We both tried to make the best of it. A few years went by. My mom didn't like to talk about it. But she started getting sick a lot. <coughs> the rest happened pretty quickly. She got better for a while. And then she didn't. And then I was alone. last finch left alive. Until I found out about you. I'm still not sure what to tell you about all this. If we lived forever, maybe we'd have time to understand things. But as it is, I think the best we can do is try to open our eyes. And appreciate how strange and brief all of this is. This journal was supposed to be for you. But now I hope you'll never see it. I just want to meet you and tell you all these stories myself. But I guess if you're reading this now, things didn't work out that way. This is where your story begins. I'm sorry I won't be there to see it. It's a lot to ask, but I don't want you to be sad that I'm gone. I want you to be amazed that any of us ever had a chance to be here at all. Good luck. <laughs>